Hello everyone. Our topic today was requested by The Ragnar Ram. We'll be going over The Hive from the Destiny franchise. Spoilers for... anything, Destiny. Lede. Okay, so the Hive are one of the four antagonistic nations slash species encountered in the Destiny games, alongside the Fallen, Cabal, and the Vex. Of the three, the Hive have the greatest connection to the Darkness, a source of paracausal power, space magic, that works in direct opposition to the Light, the source of the player's paracausal power, space magic. For more information on the Darkness and the Light, see our video on them here and in the description below. For our purposes today, all you need to know about the light and darkness is that they are sentient forces of reality able to grant power through space magic, with opposing philosophies on existence. The light believes in cooperative community, the darkness believes in survival of the fittest, and the two forces fight each other through proxies, empowering various species across reality and letting the nations thus empowered answer the argument of who is correct by seeing what happens when their various proxy states meet each other. The Hive, while not the only faction to wield the darkness, are its oldest known champions. They've been around for tens of thousands of years, and the use of the darkness's power and the following of its philosophies are at the core ideology of the Hive as a species. The modern Hive are a cast-like species of vaguely humanoid chitinous creatures. Each Hive is grown from an egg sac and, once birthed, emerges as the lowest level creature on their hierarchical totem pole, the Thrall. Over time, Thralls develop into acolytes, which are stronger, more resilient, more cunning, just better in every way. After that, though, an acolyte's further evolution is determined by a combination of its choice and the whims of their wizards. Wizards are a possible evolutionary path for acolytes. They can fly, wield the darkness, and are the hive's only breeders, uncommonly able either to sire offspring completely asexually or by taking a mate. They are also responsible for overseeing the growth and production of young, as well as handling the evolution of acolytes, generally morphing them either into fellow wizards or into knights, powerfully built and armored creatures that most often serve as the hive's greatest warriors. Less commonly, an acolyte or thrall can be turned into an ogre, a giant made of muscle and pain that can natively fire a high-powered energy beam from its... face? Are those eyes? Uh and is almost universally relegated to the bottom rungs of Hive society. Higher echelons of the Hive species remain members of each of these castes, with further upward mobility coming solely through a meritorious system. Reaching Acolyte, Knight, or Wizard is also a meritorious process, but there's no further change in morphology. These higher level beings are known as Ascendant Hive, and are almost exclusively made up of Knights and Wizards, with a much smaller handful of the other castes sprinkled among the ranks. We know there are further ranks among the Ascendant Hive, such as Princes and Priests, but the information on their hierarchy at this level is much more loosely defined thus far. We do know that at the top of the food chain lie the Hive's three god kings and queens, Oryx, Zivorath, and Savathun, who in turn pay homage to the Hive's worm gods. The worm gods are ancient, as in hinted that they may have been there when the universe was made ancient, giant worm-like creatures that commune directly with the darkness itself, and in ages past made a pact with the Hive that granted the Hive much of their power while feeding the worm gods in exchange. Originally, there were five of them, Akka, Er, Ur, Zol, and Yul. As of the Season of the Lost, there are only three left. The Hive killed one, and the player killed another. More on that later. The Hive evolved into what we know them as now, when the Hive's three god monarchs found the worm gods and made a deal. The worms would grant them eternal life, power, and the knowledge to save their people. In exchange, the Hive would free the Worm Gods, follow the tenets of the darkness, and ingest the Worm Gods' larvae. The worms so ingested would act as a link between the Hive and the Worm Gods, the worms would also feed on the Hive, and so long as the Hive gave their individual worms enough nourishment to feed them, they were fine. But if the worms go unfed, they start to devour the Hive in question from the inside. And what do the worms feed on? They don't devour conventional food, they're more a tapeworm of the soul. They devour experience, violence, and adherence to the sword logic. The sword logic is the term the Hive have given to the survival of the fittest doctrine they inherited from the worms and the darkness. Essentially, they believe that the purpose of life is to simply exist, to keep on going and resist the efforts of all creation to destroy you. If you persist, you, by definition, prove your right to exist. However, should something else destroy you, you prove that you had no right to exist in the first place. The thing that consumed you has a greater right to exist than you did. The final ideal of the sword logic is that you must continue to exist until there is nothing else, until at the end of time and the universe you are the last thing standing and are able to perpetuate your existence beyond even the limits of time itself, that reality must crumble to dust before you do, and that by doing so, you prove yourself to be the most perfect, the most worthy form of life, because at the end of all other things, 
you still continue to exist. Interestingly, the sword logic concept isn't as selfish as it might sound at first glance, but it is incredibly nihilistic and treacherous by nature. The Hive believe that it is good and right to create, to establish families, lineages, allies within the Hive, create power bases to learn and grow, but they also believe that whatever you create should be able to withstand the sword logic. If you establish a power base, breed a family, cultivate alliances, then these should be able to withstand the constant infighting of the Hive. Your power base should be able to withstand the assault or intrigues of another Hive's power base. Your lineage should survive all attempts at destruction. Your allies should not be able to successfully backstab you, though they should try to do so. Should your power base fall, your family be wiped out, your allies destroy you, this means that you, and by extension that which you have created, is not worthy of continued existence. Those who destroyed you have proven by their continued existence that they are superior beings. And the high view that this is right. By the same logic, should any member of that family, power base, or alliance survive and successfully claim vengeance for the destruction of their brood, that is also right and good, having now twice established their own right to exist. One aspect of Hive power that makes this kill or be killed mentality interesting is their access to the Ascendant Realm. The Ascendant Realm is a plane of existence seemingly adjacent to regular space where the Worm Gods make their home. Travel deep enough and it is possible to commune with the darkness directly, but additionally there is a nebulously defined power level beyond which any Hive of sufficient strength is able to enter the Ascendant Realm. Hives so capable can create throne worlds, cysts in the fabric of Ascendant space that are beholden entirely to the power of the Hive who created them. Any Hive with the power to create a throne world, when slain by conventional means, has their soul sent to their throne world, and can eventually reform a body through a number of methods. Only by being slain in a throne world, and it's inferred in all but one place only their own throne world, can such hive be slain. As such, it is common practice for powerful hive, particularly the three god monarchs, to slay and plot against one another continuously throughout time, punishing their fellows for being weak or blind enough to succumb to such attacks. The story of the Hive begins millennia ago on an ancient gas giant dubbed Fundament by the Proto-Hive. It's worth noting that technically their story begins earlier as the Proto-Hive were from some other planet, however in the even then distant past the Proto-Hive crashed their whole planet into Fundament to hide from some danger unknown to the Proto-Hive by the time we first see them. The Proto-Hive crashed their planet into the depths of the gas giant, where it broke into several continents that dotted Fundament's deep caustic sea. There the Proto-Hive lived and died for unknown generations before the birth of the three who would become the god leaders of the modern Hive. Unlike the modern Hive, which live until devoured by their inner worm or they are slain, the Proto-Hive were an incredibly short-lived race, with most of their species dying out by the age of 10, while mother breeders were capable of living a nebulously longer lifespan. The trio were born the daughters of one of the Proto-Hive's kings. The eldest, Arash, would eventually change her name to Oryx, the middle child, Sathona, would eventually become Savathun, and the youngest, Zero, would eventually become Zivuarath. They had had at least ten other siblings, however, when the floating continent of an enemy Proto-Hive nation neared their shores when the siblings were two years old, the delegation from the enemy nation devoured the other ten princesses. Their father was already 10 years old by this point and was losing his mind. Resultantly, one of his advisors sold their country out to their new neighbors, fearing that neither the king nor his remaining three daughters were fit to rule. The king was slain, but the three escaped. Sathona took the king's beloved pet, one of the worm god's larvae, with him as they escaped, though they didn't know the significance of the worm at the time. Zero, already a formidable warrior, helped clear the way for them to escape, and Arash, a skilled sailor and navigator, guided her sisters as they sailed off in her ship. Their plan was twofold. First, they wanted to return and claim vengeance for their murdered kin and stolen kingdom, but second and more importantly, before his death, their father had revealed to them that he had foreseen an alignment of the planet's 52 moons that was coming. When they lined up just so, they'd create a lunar tidal wave of such scope it would wipe out everyone and everything they knew. Not only did the sisters want revenge, they wanted to find a way to save their people from the ensuing flood. To that end, guided by the whispers of Sathona's worm, over the next three years, the trio found and repaired a ship capable of diving to the planet's core and journeyed down, hoping, thanks to the whispers of the worm, that something down there could grant them the knowledge and power to save their people. On the way down, they encountered the Leviathan, a massive being that served the light and worked with the Traveler, a major servant of and or source of the light, which was in orbit at the time. The Leviathan, with help from others, had been responsible for trapping the worm gods, who the trio were unknowingly headed for, in the core of the planet, and warned the trio off their course, telling them in a vague, wizard prophecy style that they'd be better off with the light of the Traveler. However, the Leviathan offered no concrete answers or help for the plight of the trio's people, whereas their worm did whisper such promises. So they ignored the Leviathan's warnings and headed deeper. 
Oddly, the Leviathan did nothing to stop them. When they found the worm gods, the three made a pact. Each of them would ingest a worm then and there. In addition to the carnage of war, each of them would be required to continue as they were for eternity, lest their personal worms consume them. Arash must continue to seek answers, Sathona must continue to master the arts of wit, cunning, and intellect, and Zero must continue to master and relish the art of war. So maybe she gets double points for carnage, it's unclear. Each of them then ingested a morph, whether this was a normal part of protohive evolution. We know they had at least some kind of morphology-based caste system at the time, not unlike the modern hive or something created entirely by the worm gods is unclear, but each emerged from this process a step closer to the god rulers seen in modern times, taking on adult names. Zero ingested the night morph and took the name Zivu Arath, Sathona ingested the mother morph, becoming Savathun, and Arash ingested the seemingly unique king morph, becoming Oryx and male. There are several instances of gender switching at different points in the modern hive life cycle. Oryx would not take on the name Oryx for another several millennia. The worm gods then filled the trio's ship with larvae and bid them to return to their people. Those who would join them were to be given worms, those who would not were to be slain, the tidal wave would kill them anyway. Their people needed to unite to be able to flee the planet. The trio then went on a war of conquest, taking back their home but uniting and conquering more in the process. They continuously tried to steal or build spacecraft so they could leave. However, the Traveler and its moon-based allies shot them all down in an effort to prevent the Worm Gods and their servants from escaping the planet. To get around this, the Worm Gods continued to encourage their Hive Supplicants to follow the Sword Logic. Part of the process of the Sword Logic was that as you asserted your right to exist by destroying those who opposed you, you grew in power. You literally gained paracausal might. The more you slew, the better you became at space magic. Which means that broken down to its base components, the Hive's dominant religion says EXP is real and the key to survival is to level up. Which we'd never thought of before, but we will now be unable to forget. Apparently, at least in the Destiny verse, it's true though, because they continued to slaughter the way across the planet until they developed the space magic bases for Hive FTL travel. In the modern day, they use space magic to literally cut a hole in reality and step through to the other side, sealing it up behind them. This is presumably the basis behind all of the numerous portal effects the Hive are seen using. This first time, they needed the help of the Worm Gods, but once they developed that, the Hive warped up into orbit and killed everything, except for the Traveler which escaped. The Hive then hollowed out the various moons of their homeworld, turned them into ships, and set out into the galaxy on a conquering crusade, which has never stopped. For the first several thousand years, they encountered nothing, but honed their skills and fed their worms by battling each other, having discovered the throne world concept before leaving their home planet. When they finally began encountering other life, they started devouring and destroying everything in their path like a plague of locusts, and after more than 24,000 years, and destroying at least 306 worlds, the god rulers realized something. The Worm Gods had warned them, air quotes, that as their power grew, so would the hunger of their worms. And as time went on, the three realized that they were reaching a point where not even the unfettered use of all of their power would be enough to sate their worms' hunger. So, Oryx came up with a plan. He killed his sisters in the Ascendant Plane, absorbing their power so that he was mightier than the three would have been individually. Interestingly, it's noted in this lore story that these were true deaths, despite the fact that both of them were slain in Oryx's throne world. How this works with the throne world concept is not made clear, but this also seems to be the only noted exception to the throne world permacule rule. But maybe not, since they're brought back later. It's a very fuzzy situation. Using his newfound power, Oryx traveled deep into the Ascendant Realm until he stood before Akka, the worm god to whom he personally paid tribute. There, he demanded the knowledge of how to commune directly with the darkness. Akka refused, reminding Oryx that according to the sword logic, if he wanted it, he'd have to take it. Oryx slew his worm god, taking the answers he needed, and communed directly with the darkness. When he returned, he declared himself Oryx, Taken King, and had gained the power to take people, corrupting them into twisted servants remade in what Oryx believed to be a form closer to the Sword Logic's perfect image, loyal only to him. Using this power, he continued the war he and his sisters had been in the middle of, a war they were losing, and now able to turn his fallen enemies into more troops, began pushing back against them. 
What's more, in a brutal act of war, he reconstituted Zivu Arath, then, later in a brilliant act of cunning, he reconstituted Savathun, as each was, in the Hive's mind, the personifications of those two concepts. Oryx then solved the problem of their worm's hunger, instituting the concept of the Tithe across all Hive. At the lowest echelon of Hive society, Thralls would take enough gathered slaughter to feed their worm, plus a little to grow. The rest would be passed up the food chain to their superiors, who would do the same. Up and up the ladder it went until the communal tithes reached their three god rulers. Thus, the trio were able to sustain themselves off of the might of their hordes, which also allowed them to devote more time to their individual interests, since they didn't have to spend every waking moment searching for their blade's next meal. Decades down the line, when their current foe was finally slain, the trio split for the first time, seeing that their growth would only be hampered by staying within each other's shadows. Despite their millennia-long split, there are several indications of them staying in contact. They simply split into three ever-growing hordes of destruction rather than being one supermassive hive. The Hive continued to carve their way across the cosmos in the following centuries, but the most notable events that followed we know of surround Oryx's brood. His daughters discovered a way to improve the life-saving nature of the throne worlds. One of his sons began practicing necromancy, which the Hive considered abhorrent since it kind of flew in the face of the Sword Logic's perma-destruction concept. Said son was subsequently banished, though he convinced the least of the Worm Gods to go with him, the same Worm God, ironically, that taught him necromancy in the first place. This would be the Worm God the player would eventually slay unknown centuries or millennia later. One of Oryx's other sons, Crota, while pursuing avenues of power, accidentally opened a warp gate straight into Vex territory, linking said Vex space directly with Oryx's throne world. The Vex are one of the other enemy factions in the game, and for simplicity's sake are hyper-advanced time-traveling robots who immediately went to war with Oryx's kids and their forces inside of his throne world. The two opposing forces stalemated for about a hundred years before one of the Worm Gods noticed and told Oryx to quit studying and go give his house a spring cleaning. Oryx did so, curb-stomping the Vex forces and capturing the Vex in charge of the assault since it had managed to create a hypothetical construct of the proto-hive version of Oryx that was incredibly accurate, which Oryx found intriguing. He then threw Crota through the Vex portal as punishment for starting all of this, instructing him to conquer or die before closing the portal and handing the captured Vex off to his sister Savathun as a gift, which she would end up using to manipulate Taken forces of her own, as the Vex eventually figured out how to simulate the Taken power through its simulation of Oryx. Unfortunately for Savathun, when the Vex was destroyed by the player much later, so was that power, as Savathun never figured out how to do it herself. Realizing, back when all this happened, that his throne world was vulnerable, Oryx crafted the Dreadnought, an all but indestructible capital ship from a piece of the carcass of Akka, the worm god he slew. Then he moved his throne world inside of it, making it mobile and allowing him to use his throne world powers as anti-ship weapons. A vast but untold amount of time later, Crota, the son Oryx had thrown through the Vex portal, arrived in the Soul System, the setting for the games and took over the Earth's moon, launching an attack on the Earth that was repelled, but just barely, before settling in to spend a few centuries hollowing out the moon and growing his forces, before the player perma-kills him in his throne room. Enraged at the news of his son's perma-death, Oryx headed to the Soul System next, causing a lot of damage and carnage, only to ultimately suffer the same fate at the hands of the player. In the years that followed, the local hive vied for power in the system, always being beaten down by the player any time any single hive gained too much power. But in the background, Savathun, queen of cunning, treachery, and lies, started working her magic, pulling the strings here and there behind numerous events in the system, including trying to enslave the Cabal Emperor, orchestrating events that got one of the player's leaders and closest friends killed, and most brazenly trying to interfere with messages that theoretically came from the darkness itself, while the darkness tried to communicate directly with the player and the player's allies, all while Lesser Hive continued to rise up and be stamped out by the player. This last plan, though, interfering with the darkness, brought the wrath of Zivu Arath down upon her sister, since the darkness is kind of what they've worshipped since forever, and Savathun went into hiding, especially once she fed Zivu Arath the Cabal homeworld, and that did nothing to mollify her sister. In the months since, Savathun fled into the arms of the player and their allies, who have offered protection while keeping her at arm's length, in exchange for services rendered and information given. Savathun is, of course, not to be trusted, but the player's allies think they have things under control. We'll see whether or not that changes in the coming months, as teasers for the upcoming expansion in which Savathun is set to play a large role include Hive Engineered by Savathun that can wield the light just like the player does. 
How this is accomplished and what it will mean are as yet unclear, but it is easily the most dangerous development from the Hive yet. And that's basically the Hive, evil EXP farmers from the Destinyverse. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave us a like and share it with someone you know might like it. If you have ideas for videos you'd like to see in the future, do like the Ragnar Ram and let us know in the comments down below. If you'd like to see more videos, hit that subscribe button, and if you'd like to see our Let's Plays, follow the link in the description and subscribe to our Let's Play channel. In the meantime, this has been True, True Masters, Masters of Morons, signing off.